The Schumacher Society, that's a partner of my organization in London, the New Economics Foundation, has been working in the Berkshires, um, and it's created a complementary currency as well as um, all sorts of exchange, local food exchanges and all sorts of things. But it's got now $2 million of complementary currency called the Berkshires in circulation. The banks um, buy and sell it. You can exchange your greenback for it. So it's already happening, and that means people buy local and get a premium for buying local, and people trade locally. That makes a difference. And there's even a bit of a talk at the minute to get the police department to take Berkshires in fines. We haven't got there yet, but it will happen. <laughs> <laughs> there's a transition town movement that started in the UK and is now really happening in many towns in this country. And transition towns is all about people taking, saying, how do we make our own community sustainable? How do we take, make it what, carbon neutral? How do we make it so its footprint on the earth is much lighter? And then there's this wonderful project that's happening right in downtown Cleveland. And the point about this is this not just a nice-to-do pastime for relatively wealthy people. These sort of things are happening in some of the poorest, most difficult communities as well as some of the wealthiest communities. This is about being human beings. And in Cleveland, probably some of you know, with all the industrial crash, the population of Cleveland has gone down from 900,000 to 300,000. Just think about that for a second. And those jobs have gone, and the people remaining, it's like a wasteland. Well, I better just drink some water, because I can see I'm talking too much. And um, Well, what's happened is they realize that it's no use just relying on government schemes and handouts, because already, right there in Port, in Cleveland, there's a phenomenal buying power that wasn't being used. And that's the hospital, that's the schools. Hospitals buying masses amount of vegetables from where? California and places. Now when you're sitting there in Cleveland with no jobs, why aren't those jobs going locally? And that's what's happened. A whole lot of workers' co-ops have been set up and they're big scale and they're providing services to the hospital, to the city, to the schools, to all those things. And what's being built at the minute is the biggest urban greenhouse anywhere here in the USA, a hydroponic greenhouse, which will grow masses of vegetables for the hospital, for the schools, and all sorts of fresh food. One of the biggest solar um, suppliers is again another co-op that's supplying, putting solar panels on all the roofs in Cleveland. Um, there's a laundry that's like an industrial scale laundry owned by the people who work in it again as a co-op, which is doing all the laundry, the sheets for the hospital, for the, all sorts of other institutions, the nursing homes, all those things in Cleveland. And that's providing employment, hope, for those people in the inner city who didn't have it, and it's revitalizing the city. That's what new economics is about. It's about taking things into our own hands. So right here, probably 6% of the American economy is already what I would call a new economy. It's happening. But then let me just talk about my country, the UK, because my organization, the New Economics Foundation, has been now working for about 25 years. And Richard, I'm now the second director. And we had lots of coordinators before. So we went around on empty for about 10 years and then managed to get a director. And I'm now the second one. Um, we have call ourselves very inelegantly, but accurately, a think and do tank, because we're one of the biggest um, research and policy outfits in the UK with 50 people plus all sorts of interns and um, people in universities and partners. But we also do, we work in communities and we do practical stuff. So we try and learn from both. And we have been working for a long time on measuring well-being. And you can measure well-being. It's not an airy-fairy thing, it's actually very measurable. You have to ask people a lot of questions and you have to do it the proper way. But roughly 50% of our well-being as a human, sorry, roughly 40% of our well-being as a human comes either from our genetic makeup or our first two years of life. And nobody knows which one it is and it's impossible to tell. Another 10%, and it's only 10%, comes from whether we're rich, poor, married, not married, those sort of things. 
50% comes from the quality of our relationships with others and whether we feel valuable and valued. And that 50% is amenable to working on, it's amenable to policy, and it's important to measure it. So, for example, we did a survey of about 2,000 school kids in a place in the north of England and looked at girls. Looked at girls, 15 to 17 year old, who were in school, in all sorts of schools, rich, poor again, all sorts of backgrounds, and we looked at those girls that were both doing well in school and had high levels of happiness. And we thought the biggest factor that was in common with those groups would be, did they have boyfriends? Or did they have a really good friendship group? Those were important. Or did they come from a, a relatively well-off family? But none of them were the main factor. It was, were they involved in team activities like sports, art and music? That was by far the biggest determinant. And if you just think about that for a second, it says, one of the most important things you should do is not cut your school music services, not cut your art courses, not cut the sports activities or close down the playing fields that we've done in our country. You should put more resources into those things that give kids and give people, because we're all kids um, at one level, a sense of being valued and valuable. So we went on to measure these things. Um, we did a, something called the Happy Planet Index that looked at um, which countries were creating happy and long lives for their citizens at least cost of the planet. Costa Rica comes out number one because they don't spend any money on the army. They live longer than people do here. They could spend a lot of money on health care. And they live within planetary limits. They live at one planet's level of resources, whereas here we live at five planets' level of resources. So US is, I'm afraid, 144th out of the countries in the world on the Happy Planet Index, and my country is about 101. Not very clever. So when you look at progress that way, we're perhaps going backwards and other people are doing it better than us. But we went on from that to do some, the first ever national accounts of well-being in the world across 22 European countries. And now we and others have persuaded our government in the UK to measure not just GDP but well-being. And that sounds like a bit of a geeky thing but it's actually terribly important because what we measure is what matters. And if we start reporting, you know, that GDP has gone up, but people's well-being has gone down, and you hold the government to account, that's starting to tell you a story. So it's desperately important, and we're working in Ecuador and other places. So that's a change that's happened from that research up to the bigger level. We've done lots of work at the local level on community energy and things, but we've then gone on to push the idea of a Green New Deal, tackling the recession by creating green jobs and the sort of things being talked about here. And actually Obama's campaign used our term. We came up with that term Green New Deal first. And there's been lots of talk in many countries, but not so much action. There's been a lot of greenwash. Um, but that work has led in the UK to what's called feed-in tariffs. So if I generate electricity or a community generates electricity by wind, by renewable means or by solar, it gets paid not just for what it feeds back into the grid, but also for every kilowatt it generates, which makes that economically viable. Because at the minute, solar panels and wind turbines cost far too much. So just leaving it to the market don't work. You've got to intervene in the market initially to, make, to get that technology off the ground. And that's happened. And we've also committed as the British government to serious carbon reduction targets, the first government of the world to do that. Now, the British government's got lots of flaws, but that sort of very practical work, campaigning, research and policies can lead to changing things that everybody said are impossible to change. That's why I'm going on, not to say we're a great organisation, though I obviously believe we are, but because it's possible. And you could change things, not just at the local level, but the national level. We're, because we've done so much work in my country on creating credit unions and banks, and we created some ourselves and supported others, we've now seen as one of the organizations that's most authoritative around what should happen to the banks. And so we're giving seminars inside the UK Treasury and in the Bank of England, which is a bit of a joke, because normally we would have been thrown out of the door, you know, as a bit of people who wouldn't be let across the pedestal. But they're listening. I'm not sure they're going to take enough notice, but they're listening. 
and that really helps as well. And because we've created a thousand businesses in some of the most deprived areas of the UK, again, people like our business secretary are listening when we talk about industrial strategy and what needs to happen. So that work on the ground needs to be linked to research and policy, which then and campaigning, which then can enable you to change things at the national level. So these things are possible. And just to give you a, another little view, um, there's a place called Luton, in, in the, just north of London, 30 miles north of London. A very poor community on the edge of Luton. It's uh, quite an ethnically diverse community. There's been quite serious riots there. So this is inner city, serious riots. We worked with the local community people, community leaders, to look to do an exercise in that community, which is seen as the, one of the poorest in England, to see how much money they really had and what they could do with it. And by, we sat down with all the community and worked out how much money was coming in and what was going out. And worked, sort of things that came up were they were spending three million pounds, or about four and a half million dollars a year, on takeaway pizzas. And they said, this is stupid. Once we put it together, we'll make our own pizzas. So they set up their own pizza business as a co-op, employs 15 people, makes much nicer pizzas right there on the estate. They said, how much are we spending, is the council spending on our old people or the private companies that come in? And they realized they could train up people to do care and bid for the care of their old people. So once you start analyzing, you don't just need to say, I want more money. You need to start need saying, what wealth have we already got and what can we do with it? And that's a different take. And similarly, time banks came from the US to the UK, and we helped create them in the UK. But that concept that I talked about earlier on time banks here in Portland has led to some very interesting things happening, which is around the idea of co-production, that you don't think of public services, and it's an awful word, I'm sorry, there's no better word for it at the minute, I want to find one. So if any of you can tell me, please do, answers on a postcard. But what co-production means is instead of being a patient um, coming from a medical service or instead of being a pupil or instead of being a young person in a young person's service, you are an actor. You have power. You have some role in delivering your own service. So it's not just you're on a board talking about what you want. It's you're actually part of that. And that's turned out to be very powerful because there isn't enough money to go around and there probably won't ever be to run all the public services the way we want them. But where we've worked with a number of councils, local authorities in the UK that were going to cut their youth services, for example, and we said, hang on, don't cut them. Yet the young people have a say about what they could do. And in some cases, they're operating something that's involving those young people and actually running it, doing the back office, doing the computer work, that is not just operating on a smaller budget, it's having much greater results. So it's not, you've got to be careful with this one because you don't want to just say, give an excuse for money to be cut to public services, but it is a way of giving people more power and more influence. So all those things, I just wanted to give you a flavor that something very different is possible. So anybody who says it's not possible, no, it is possible.